I've been, I've been reading Steve on environmental issues for years. Some of you will remember the East, East Anglia emails when, when, that, when that, those broke. Uh, Steve's writing on this was, was enormously helpful for those of us who are not experts but trying to follow it. Steve is also involved with Breakthrough, a group of people uh, from both uh, the center and, and the right. Uh, I guess some liberals too. Yeah. Some liberals too who are trying to make sense of, of, of energy policy. Um, after Steve speaks, uh, Ido Wernick will speak. Uh, Ido is a, professor, a, f a physicist, a professor at uh, City College and Rockefeller University, and he's, and he's this is unusual, an industrial eco ecologist, uh, not a common occupation. And Ido, Ido will comment on, on uh, what Steve has to say. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here, actually, and I'm grateful for everyone for coming out. Uh, for one thing, I really was curious to visit St. Francis University and see if it, I, I was just sort of amazed at the idea of, uh, of, of the question of what's a nice Jewish boy like Fred Siegel doing teaching at a Catholic university, right? It sort of reminded me of the old um, Yogi Berra line, I'm sure some of you know, uh, as the, who knows if this is true, most of them aren't. Uh, the, the, the saying goes that uh, he was told the news that a Jewish fellow had been elected mayor of Dublin, to which the yogi predictably responded, only in America, <laughs> right? And uh, that's actually sort of a nice way to lead into sort of my chosen topic. Uh, it's advertised as, can a conservative be an environmentalist? Uh, or sometimes I will do the topic a little bit more provocatively and say, is conservative environmentalist an oxymoron? Uh, people who are curious will come thinking, surely the answer is no, let's go home. Uh, or if they're slightly more optimistic, uh, they will come thinking, surely they will see the moron in the oxymoron. Um, uh, but uh, I'll see if I can make this case. Uh, so I'm something of an odd duck, a musical accompaniment. Um, I've been called a green conservative, not a title I use or advertise myself, but I've been called that by Newsweek, The Economist, The New Republic, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. I think that's about all that's left in media now, right? Uh, though I'm really not that far, uh, I'm not in that an isolated or exotic example. There are a lot of folks uh, like me out there. It's just that no one pays much attention to us. The media is not interested in such odd people. Uh, the term green conservative seems impossible to the conventional wisdom today. And in fact, the one and only time I ever got to meet Al Gore, uh, I uh, mentioned that I had been described thusly in uh, you know, major media, and it generated a startled look and arched eyebrows on his face. Uh, which thus disproved a favorite conservative stereotype that Gore is in fact an animatronic robot from Futurama. <laughs> so, so what I want to do is I want to set out first with a general axiom, uh, then a very quick survey question with a show of hands, and then a pop quiz. Uh, and then I'll make a couple of provisional observations and we'll work through some themes. Uh, my general axiom is that the environment is much too important to be left to environmentalists. They just screw everything up. More on that in due course. And my survey question, especially here in New York, is this. Can I have a show of hands of everybody in the audience who's in favor of destroying the environment? <laughs> it's true what they say about New York. There are no Republicans here. <laughs> right? <laughs> now for the pop quiz. Here's a quote. Uh, you don't actually, I mean, I'll tell you the answer, of course. But if you have a, if a name pops into your head um, when I ask you, uh, feel free to shout it out. Here's the quote, there is an absolute necessity of waging all out war against the debauching of the environment. The bulldozer mentality of the past is a luxury we can no longer afford. Our roads and other public projects must be planned to prevent the destruction of scenic resources and to avoid needlessly upsetting the ecological balance, end quote. So what do you think, or what kind of person would say something like that? You know, most people usually say Al Gore or Barbara Streisand or Ralph Nader. What's that? Uh, no, uh, actually the correct answer is Governor Ronald Reagan in 1970 in the State of the State speech. And in fact, if you read Reagan's record as governor, where his, uh, he, he had hired someone from the Sierra Club to be his director of natural resources, this is long forgotten, uh, uh, you find out that environmentalists were mostly happy with his record. Uh, in later years, he would get attacked for having once said, if you've seen one redwood, you've seen them all. 
uh, ignoring actually the facts. This is a common problem with environmentalists. Reagan set aside more acreage of redwoods than any other California governor in history. He did it in state land. He didn't want the federal government to do it for some of the usual reasons of federalism. Uh, let me give you a second quote from a prominent political magazine. Quote goes this way, if corporations do not stop polluting, we must find ways to compel them to in some way. Important people must be interfered with before notice will be taken of disagreeable facts. Instead of demonstrating on Fifth Avenue on behalf of baby seals, the saviors of the environment would get far better results picketing the country clubs of Nassau, Fairfield, and Morris counties, end quote. Where do you suppose, uh, what kind of political magazine would run that? You'd guess the nation, the new republic, the progressive, in these times. Turns out the right answer is National Review. That was in William F. Buckley's magazine in 1970, the time of the first Earth Day. That's not a quotation taken out of context, by the way, if you're wondering. It was not, this is the writer's first person voice. He's not quoting a, an eco protester on the corner somewhere or in Central Park. Uh, and you know, this is sort of astonishing. And, and a lot can be said about why conservatives don't like to talk that way today. Uh, but one of the ironies that's also forgotten in the history of this uh, is that at the same time that a lot of conservatives were articulating environmental sympathies, and I'm mentioning a couple more examples going forward, uh, the, a lot of liberals, and especially the radical left, were not enthusiastic about this new cause that arrived. Uh, I'll give you another example. Most people don't know that before he ran for president in 1964, Barry Goldwater had been a longtime member of the Sierra Club. I don't think the Sierra Club today would take John McCain as a member, Goldwater's successor, if he applied, right? Uh, and it's also forgotten that one of the chief sponsors of uh, the Endangered Species Act in 1973 was, as he was described by his brother, the sainted junior senator from New York, um, James Buckley. And I always like to say, you want to sit down for this, but you already are. I saw a photo recently of the 40th anniversary of President Nixon signing the Endangered Species Act. And there was Senator Buckley and the other chief Republican co-sponsor of the Endangered Species Act, Strom Thurmond. People can't believe it. it makes heads explode if they sort of know who these people were, right? Uh, Buckley, uh, he's very old now. He's in his 90s, but still pretty spry. He still dispends the Endangered Species Act, although he's not happy about the way it's unfolded. Long story, of course. On the left, you had people like Students for a Democratic Society saying students should boycott the Earth Day observances on college campuses because it's a Nixon plot to distract us from the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, well, never mind the SDS. So they're long gone. Uh, the New Republic magazine ran a very uh, dyspeptic editorial, which was called The Ecology Craze. Here's what they said. Rallying around the ecology banner is the biggest assortment of ill-matched allies since the Crusades. Worst of all, of course, the ecology binge. This is language you'd expect from National Review, right? Not the New Republic. The ecology binge provides a cop-out for a president and a populace too cheap or too gutless or too tired or too frustrated or too all of them to tangle harder with some of the old problems that have proved resistant and emotionally unsatisfying to boot. Across the river and uptown at Columbia University, in those days, Amitai Etzioni in Science Magazine, which today is pretty orthodox green, I think you'd say, he called ecology a fad. He said this, quote, the newly found environmental dangers are being vastly exaggerated. Try and find that in Science Magazine today, by the way. Fighting hunger, malnutrition, and rats should be given priority over saving wildlife and improving our schools over constructing waste disposal systems. You get drummed out of uh, sort of the you know, environmental world if you say something like that today, if you're a liberal. Uh, but those criticisms were mild compared to what civil rights leaders were saying. For instance, Richard Hatcher, who was the African, -America, uh, African American mayor of Gary, Indiana at the time, he was quoted in Time Magazine as follows, quote, the nation's concern for the environment has done what George Wallace was unable to do, distract the nation from the human problems of black and brown Americans. Uh, Whitney Young, then the president of the National Urban League, said, the war on pollution is one that should be waged after the war on poverty is won. Common sense calls for reasonable national priorities and not for inventing new causes whose main appeal seems to be in their potential for copping out and ignoring the most dangerous and pressing of our problems. And if you go down a little bit further to the street level, Time Magazine quoted someone that in those days, they described him as a black militant in Chicago. And his quote to Time was, ecology, I don't give a good goddamn about ecology. 
Okay, this is sort of, you can see why the environmental movement in more recent years decided it needed to come up with environmental justice to try and bridge this problem. Although it's still true that most of your mainline uh, environmental organizations are overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly affluent, um, uh, and, uh, and then you talk about the whole environmental justice business at great length. Um, and here's the final thing to remember about the sort of beginnings of modern environmentalism now 45 years ago. The irony, if you think about how polarized it is today, is that at the time it was thought that the environment would be the new consensus issue that we wouldn't fight about and that we could make great progress on. And you know, for a couple of years we did. Most of the early statutes like the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act passed almost unanimously. Dangerous Species Act passed easily. Uh, Nixon did veto one version of the Clean Water Bill, but that was a spending. It wasn't, a, it wasn't opposed to the general architecture of it. They thought Congress was spending too much money too fast. Uh, and and we, we reached for that issue under Nixon uh, because at the end of the 1960s, if you know your history, you're old enough, we'd hit the, we'd hit the rocks on social policy of the great society, right? Um, and you know, environment was going to be the way we'd move forward domestically, and a lot to be done. Um, and the, so the irony is, is by the 1990s, we had reforged a lot of our consensus on social policy, never perfectly, of course, but you think of welfare reform, uh, crime. Now, of course, both of those are coming apart again uh, in ways that resemble where we were 50 years ago, uh, unfortunately. Uh, even education. Um, and, and that, I think, is uh, something to be talked about in a moment. Um, now, and so today, if you look at opinion polls, there is no issue, domestic issue, that's more polarizing between left and right, between Republicans and Democrats, than the environment. It's the widest gap of all. And as I say, if you went back 45 years ago and predicted that, people would have thought that was uh, uh, you know, unlikely. Uh, I mean, if Ronald Reagan, and by the way, you can go through lots more of Reagan's policies as governor, he was way in advance of the Clean Air Act, because California, where I grew up, had the worst smog by a lot. Um, and now it's become a big skirmish line in the culture wars, too, right? Um, conservatives like to tell jo uh, jokes about the tastiness of spotted owls roasted over a campfire, right? Uh, now, if you step back for a moment and leave aside your partisan perceptions and preferences, ponder this a little more deeper, I think. If you're the proverbial being from Mars dropped on the American scene, uh, nothing, I think, would seem more uh, likely or natural than to assume that environmentalism would be a conservative enthusiasm. So just take the obvious. Uh, the, uh, the term conservative and conservationism share the same etymological root. Uh, and even though conservation and conservationism and environmentalism are not identical, they're at least clearly blood, re uh, blood relatives. If you get beyond just the obvious etymology, I think you can see a close kinship between conservatism and environmentalism on a very deep level. Namely, from a certain point of view, they're both champions of lost causes. Both are heralds against the remorseless imperatives of relentless progress. So I don't know how many of you uh, know if your conservative folklore, uh, but the mission statement for William F. Buckley's National Review in 1955, it's famous for people like me, goes as follows, uh, quote, to stand athwart history yelling stop at a time when no one is inclined to do so or to have much patience with those who so urge it, end quote. Now I think without any change at all, uh, that could be the mission statement for Greenpeace or Earth First, couldn't it? Both conservatism and environmentalism are powerless to stop progress in its tracks or even deflect it very much. And, and hence, I think both conservatism and environmentalism as a philosophy, they derive a lot of their imagination and deep uh, uh, romantic appeal from an appreciation of the tragic sense of life except that one of, one of the many defects of conventional environmentalism is it doesn't really grasp the tragic sense of life in a serious way. It's too utopian in its outlook. If they actually did grasp that, we'd have a better environmentalism. Uh, and now and then I note with irony when an environmentalist today will make a criticism that was made by conservatives 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, one of my favorite examples from really the late 90s, and it's carried on in the last decade, it's in abeyance for the moment because of what happened to the housing uh, part of our economy, right, a few years ago. Uh, but it was when you had the enthusiasm for new urbanism and smart growth, as it was called, amongst environmentalists. And especially you had a lot of books from people of a very far left disposition attacking the interstate highways, especially as they rammed through cities. Well, guess what? If you go back to the 50s, when the interstate highways were being proposed and then built, you had Russell Kirk, the author of the seminal book, The Conservative Mind, or the conservative sociologist Robert Nisbet, 
both saying, you know, these interstate highways are really a bad idea, especially if they're ripping up neighborhoods and cities. No one listened to them. Mayors all wanted the pork barrel. Uh, you know, we wanted to suburbanize as fast as we could. And now environmentalists discovered this, as I say, 50 years after conservatives were saying it. Uh, Russell Kirk said, this is going to be ruin for rural communities. You know, it used to be the highways that go through town. Now on the interstates, you're going to have, he sort of saw the future. It's going to be uniform McDonald's, right? That's what the interstates have done. Uh, and uh, if Russell Kirk were still alive, he died 20 years ago now, um, I think he would be quite sympathetic with people who dislike Walmart and Starbucks. Or my favorite example from that era was environmentalist about 20 years ago discovered Jane Jacobs' wonderful book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. I don't think they read parts of it. I think they read it selectively, but that's okay. Uh, William F. Buckley included excerpts of that book in one of his early anthologies of conservative thought, even though Jane Jacobs was not especially political in any recognizable way. Uh, but I used to like to say to environmentalists who'd bring up Jane Jacobs, I'd say, oh, congratulations. I'm glad you're reading a book we liked 40 years ago. Welcome to the party. What took you so long to get here? You know, slow learners. Edmund Burke, you know, the, the patron saint, really, of modern conservatism, he wrote this in his book, The Vindication of Natural Society, which was his satirical reply, so to speak, to Rousseau. He said, the great error of our nature is not to know where to stop, not to be satisfied with any reasonable acquirement, not to compound with our condition, but to lose all we have gained by an insatiable pursuit after more. And it's a fairly recognizable critique of materialism. And he goes on to say things very much in that vein uh, that I'll skip over in the interest of time. And, and again, the point, 100 years before John Muir started saying things like this, or Thoreau, 50 years ahead of Thoreau at least, 200 years before Wendell Berry or Bill McKibben, who often seem to act like they discovered these ideas for the first time. Now, despite this philosophical harmony uh, between conservatism and environmentalism that you can make out on the surface and in several levels of depth, I think it was always in the, card that, uh, in the cards that conservatives would become critical of environmentalism, at least in the U.S., for three reasons. Uh, first uh, was environmentalism became politicized and absorbed by the activist left at a very early time. Uh, and then descending from that a little bit is environmental policy has uh, 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 really from the beginning, uh, uh, gone down a track of costly centralized bureaucracy. Some of that was necessary, but a lot of it isn't and wasn't. And above all, I like to say that the EPA has this extraordinary talent of devising billion dollar solutions to million dollar problems. Seems like the only unlimited resource for environmentalists is taxpayer dollars or someone else's dollars, right? And the political level, you know, I mentioned the New Republic was hostile to the idea originally. By 1974, you'd read things like this in the New Republic from this example from their columnist, James Ridgway. Quote, ecology offers liberal-minded people what they have longed for, a safe, rational, and above all, peaceful way of remaking society and developing a more coherent central state. No, no, that won't do it all. Uh, you do talk like that, and conservatives are going to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Um, <laughs> But even given what happened there, that's sort of obvious and easy to make out. Um, that's not entirely adequate. And I got to thinking about how, well, OK, um, but, but why are the politics of the environmental issues so abnormal compared to others? Uh, if you think about uh, education is a good example. Now, conservatives hate the teachers' unions. They hate the public education bureaucracy. They dislike most of the advocacy groups on the left in education, and yet, there's a long record of conservatives sitting down and cutting deals and working productively uh, with teachers union groups, with advocacy groups, on things like charter schools, curriculum reform, on down the list. Why does that not happen on the environment? Uh, that leads to my second reason, uh, which is that uh, the apocalyptic strain of, 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 uh, of thought that comes to sight in popular environmentalism, this is an important point, I think a distinction can be made between the, the, the popular environmentalism you see in the media and the advocacy groups and academics, you know, in science departments, earth sciences departments, environmental studies, who I think are much more serious about things and tend to be much less Malthusian. That's the key word. Popular environmentalism is still very Malthusian. Uh, and like all apocalyptic visions of whatever source, religious, secular, uh, you know, revolutionary, like communism or something, it leads to a very unpleasant moral unctuousness. And you really see this about what I call the sort of rigid orthodoxy of the whole climate change business. And now every now and then, environmentalists uh, try and shake off this Malthusianism. They realize this is a dead end. They re sometimes they admit they were wrong. 
uh, and they struggle. And the comparison I use is they're like a devoted 12-stepper. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, Malthusianism. It was Thomas Malthus. The uh, uh, he's the guy that led Thomas Carlyle to call economics the dismal science. Malthus's view was uh, two things would happen: our population would outstrip our resources, we would drown in our own pollution, and we'd run out of uh, we'd starve to death because we'd run out of food, we'd run out of steel. So sort of crudely put. Um, and you know, in, and it's 200 years ago. There've been big arguments about it ever since. Um, and I think what happens is it's, uh, it's still around, as I say, not so much amongst serious academic environmentalists um, uh, as it is amongst the popular mind. It then gets into the news media, of course, because the news media eats up this kind of stuff, right? Uh, you know, they love plane crash stories. A plane lands safely doesn't make for good copy, doesn't get you on the front page. But repeatedly, I think, uh, like uh, the 12 the stepper uh, or the AA dropout, they walk by a well lit tavern and suddenly they stumble and go on a bender again. They just can't help it. Um, you get books like Jared Diamond's Collapse a few years ago. I wrote a long review of that. Uh, Gus Speth at Yale puts out a, a long series of books. I'll describe some parts of those in a minute that, that default to the uh, you know, sort of old standard cliche written um, Malthusianism, I think. And that leads to the third and deepest reason for the current conservative antipathy toward environmentalism, which is the distinct echoes of Rousseau and his successors that you see in popular environmental thought. And for Brett, Fred's benefit, since I know he's a slow learner, uh, the way I summarize Rousseau for these purposes <laughs> is, um, uh, you know, Rousseau has the view that uh, humans are estranged from a benevolent state of nature, that human society and institutions corrupt uh, man's harmony with nature and can be changed through a supreme act of will. I think that's a decent enough summary. Um, at least that's the way it's come to sight in sort of popular terms. Um, so I mentioned Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. You know, he's a really good anthropologist, and the Collapse book goes through hundreds of pages of really intricate analysis of some of the ecological contributors to the collapse of earlier civilizations. And then he gets to the end and tries to look out ahead, and all you get are these gauzy bromides. Here's one quote, we need to have the courage to practice long-term thinking. Well, that's really specific. Or we need the courage to make painful decisions about values. It's not exactly concrete guidance. Uh, and then, you know, I still encourage people to read Al Gore's first big book, Earth and the Balance. It's now very old and out of date. And most people read it for the scientific arguments and claims. And I thought, okay, fine. But you really ought to read it carefully for its philosophy. Because it's there that he describes our civilization as, and here's his words, deeply dysfunctional. And saying what's needed to solve our problems is, quote, a wrenching transformation of society. Gus Speth, I mentioned in this, one of his recent books, Red Sky at Morning, he calls for, quote, the most fundamental transition of all, a transition in culture and consciousness. Now, you know, if, cons if conservatives can't persuade people of anything else, it's that wrenching transformations of society, especially when politically driven, uh, uh, are very difficult to bring about, if at all, and almost never end in anything less than disaster. Uh, and, but the more I thought about this, you know, Gore kind of puzzled me. Uh, you know, he write these really, and there's more by the way, I could go on about the really deep radicalism that I don't think he quite even understands in his own book. Um, maybe he didn't write it, I mean there's still controversy about that, right? Um, but um, on the one hand you had this politician calling for a wrenching transformation. And on the other hand you had this very cautious practical politician as vice president and then as a candidate for president. Uh, you know, one of the ironies, uh, sometimes I think about the political stupidity of environmentalists. People have forgotten this when Al Gore became the hero on climate change a few years ago, that when he ran for president in 2000, a number of prominent environmental groups endorsed Bill Bradley in the Democratic primaries. Why? Because Gore had been insufficiently rigorous from their point of view. He was impure on the environment. And, you know, uh, we, we, you know, the vote in Florida was so close, you could say the Zoroastrian vote was the tip, was the, made the difference, right? On the other hand, I don't think it's implausible. There's, there's dispute about this amongst political scientists, but you know, if environmentalists hadn't been so purist about Gore, uh, maybe some of those 100,000 votes for Ralph Nader and Florida might have gone the other way. I don't know. Um, but the, the more I think about it, the point is, is I don't think Al Gore's a radical. Maybe he is, but at least as a practical political person, he wasn't and isn't. He's a very rich man now, right? And so when I read things about we need wrenching transformations, we need to change our consciousness, um, 
I, at the end of the day, I think that reflects not really a deep and serious attachment to Rousseau or Heidegger's, the other figure who I think lurks around as the ghostly presence behind a lot of this, and most people don't know it at all, who, who talk this way. Uh, rather, I think it's a reflection of the unhappy truth that there are a lot of environmental problems, especially on the global scale, that we really don't know what to do about. And that's true, I think, beyond the problem of climate change. Um, you know, species extinction and habitat loss, which will go on, I mean, everyone likes to connect everything to climate. I think that's a big mistake. If you wave a magic wand and make climate change go away, uh, you still have the problem of habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, species extinction. I think those problems are overestimated, but not wrong. Uh, and so when you hear people say uh, things like the most, we need to have a transition in consciousness, we need to have wrenching transformations of society, I finally came to the view that these are not serious, thought-out views on what should be done. I view them clinically. They're cries for help. Um, and I think that that kind of untethered language represents the limitations, the grave limitations of conventional environmental thought. And instead of generating a thoughtful humility about what we don't know about complex environmental challenges, uh, instead we get these demands for a rigid orthodoxy. It's especially, as I say, on climate change, but it's true of a lot of other issues, too. And I think that bespeaks a kind of fanaticism that results either in authoritarianism or the self-destruction of their own movement in the end of the day. And, I, you know, I think if an environmental is, the environmental movement is very powerful, it's very rich, they've got a lot of resources, they command a lot of respect, and I think they're going to end up eventually, uh, maybe some decades still, but they're going to end up as forlorn as the World Esperanto Association. However, this also means, now to be turned the, the uh, glass around, it means that conservatives have overreacted to some of these radical sounding tendencies in conventional environmental thought. Uh, now, uh, so why should anyone care who's not a conservative if conservatives have anything serious to say about the issue? Uh, or care why it's a liberal monopoly? Well, make me make a couple of um, practical political observations that seem to be lost on everybody. Uh, first of all, having environmentalism be a liberal monopoly is a disaster for the environment. I mean, environmentalists can win a lot of battles, especially in court. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, they actually can't get a lot of new things they want. I mean, you know, we, uh, I, I like to joke about how we did get a no child left behind bill for the conventional reasons I mentioned earlier about when you have the two parties or two sides competing for an issue, you make some policy progress. Nobody's happy about the outcome. There's lots of things people hate about No Child Left Behind, but it's unthinkable today that you can have any kind of process about a No Species Left Behind Act. And by the way, the Endangered Species Act is not that, and serious environmentalists know it's not and know it's gravely defective, and there's zero chance of having any policy discussion about doing something better. Zero. Um, I can go on about, uh, and partly I think, uh, again, to you know, smack around the environmentalists some more because you can never do it enough. Um, I remember an especially revealing episode under Bush 10, 11 years ago. Um, the Bush administration, which of course wanted to pave over and destroy the planet and, and gut the Clean Air Act, we were told, well, along the way, they uh, produced uh, something that had been going on a long time, it started under Clinton, they kept it going and brought it to the finish line, a, a Clean Air Rule under the Clean Air Act for off-road diesel emissions. Now, I know a lot about the Clean Air Act. I wrote a whole book about it 10 years ago. I won't bore you here, except to say that that's one of those hard-fought, grounded-out rules. That's actually a good one. This is one of the things the EPA does well and right. And the NRDC had worked very hard on this rule. You know, some environmental groups will take on a particular cause and work really hard at it. There's some problems with that, but the NRDC has some really serious people about this. And what happened was, is when the rule was announced, the NRDC put out a press release saying, uh, the Bush administration has done something great. This is a really important rule, the next frontier. And it's amazing now that one of the leading sources of conventional air pollution is off-road vehicles, tractors, things of that kind. And we need to do emission standards for them. And what happened was they got blasted by the Sierra Club and other people in their club saying, you're not talking the party line. You don't want to say anything good about Bush. And they withdrew the press release. That's how bad things are. And I think that's just stupid. Uh, and, and so, you know, another episode more recently, if you go back to 2010, the Waxman-Markey cap-and-trade bill had passed the House under a very difficult debate. It is stuck in the Senate. When Democrats still had 60 votes, or 59 votes, I think, Lindsey Graham was trying to broker a deal with John Kerry, and Joe Lieberman was still there then, and couldn't make it work. Too many Democrats didn't like the bill, right? That was part of the story. 
Never mind that the bill was completely stupid and would have done nothing. I'd leave that wonky to, uh, uh, details to the side. Just talk about the politics of it. When the whole thing finally collapsed, Lindsey Graham, uh, I don't, I'm not a huge Lindsey Graham fan, but uh, he said, well, you know, for Republicans, it's not like we've really lost any friends but not being able to get this deal done, right? Give you another example. I mentioned uh, John McCain earlier. Uh, the League of Conservation Voters does their scorecards. I've actually gone through and figured out that they're really the League of Democratic Conservation Voters. They rigged their scorecards to make Democrats look good and Republicans look bad. And I can go through, I won't go through details now. I wrote an article about it for Weekly Week Standard once. But I'll give you one example. So John McCain, who proposed higher mileage standards for cars with John Kerry, proposed two emissions trading plans with Joe Lieberman. Year after year, his voting, uh, his uh, 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 rating by the League of Conservation Voters was zero. Let that sink in for a bit. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I say environmentalism is heading to be as forlorn as the um, World Esperanto Association is, and this is very clear from the survey data, is uh, it's one thing to think about what the United States was like in 1970. You know, I was a sixth grader in Los Angeles with smog levels actually sort of infinitely higher than they are today. LA is pretty clean except for some tough pockets that I can map for you actually. Um, and you know, I couldn't breathe in the afternoons as a kid. Um, and so yeah, I mean, it was sort of plausible the world might be coming to an end if we didn't figure something out. Um, uh, but you know, uh, if you look at survey data, most people think they're worried about the world. You know, my own town and neighborhood is pretty good. You know, some people, you know, things have improved. Uh, but the news seems to have not gotten to environmental groups uh, who sort of go on talking the same language of the 1970s. And what you see in the survey data is the public is suffering from what uh, uh, some very smart uh, uh, opinion analysts call apocalypse fatigue, right? So a few years ago, Nick Kristoff, some of you probably read Nick in the New York Times, right? He wrote a column actually based on our mutual friends, Edo's and mine, out in California. He wrote a column uh, in the New York Times. He said, quote, it's critical to have a credible, nuanced, highly respected environmental movement, and right now I'm afraid we don't have one. Environmental alarms have been screeching for so long that like car alarms, they are now just an irritating background noise, end quote. Uh, by the way, you can, you can find the column, it's you know, still up online. Uh, the response to it was pretty hostile, especially from environmentalists who don't brook any criticism very well. Uh, now, um, I haven't described what a conservative environmentalism might be like. Uh, I've actually written a fair bit about this, including most recently, there's this conservative reform network, known as the Reformacons. That's the, sort of a new branch of conservatism now that's kind of controversial. I've done the energy and environment position paper for them. I've written a lot of other stuff on this. Um, it it take, would take a long time to talk about this because this is a huge sprawling subject and I've talked mostly about philosophy and I haven't talked at all about policy which is where the rubber meets the road. Um, I forgot to bring with me, uh, I, have this, I have these recycled plastic bags, I actually weave them into little bags that my kids used to use to pick up shells and of course now we ban plastic bags because you would, you know, we're not pro-choice about everything apparently. And I, I use that to illustrate uh, a sort of the rigidity of the way we think about some of these problems. Um, I've been mixed up for years with the Sand County Foundation in Wisconsin. I'm a board member. It's a tiny little organization, not involved in politics at all. What do we do with our $4 million budget? Uh, we pay farmers and ranchers to figure out better, best practices for water management, to reduce pollution and use less water, and set up water markets so they can sell the water they save instead of having just to use it or lose it uh, proposition. We turned to that a few years ago. We actually called the project Water as a Crop. We turned to that project a few years ago after we'd finished a big project in the 1990s in the upper Midwest where we bought dams. You know, there are like two million dams in this country. We think, we don't really know. And you know, if the government is gonna take down a dam, well, there's gonna be the usual fight of who's gonna pay for it and you know, all the bureaucracy involved. We found you could buy some of these dams for 200,000 bucks. They weren't big, it was sort of the width of this room across things like the Baraboo River. We'd buy them, then we'd hire a contractor and you know, do some careful work and have them removed and restored free-flowing rivers in Wisconsin. Uh, this is very much sort of Tocquevillean environmentalism from the bottom up. Uh, it takes seriously the old bumper sticker, think globally and act locally. Um, I, most people who have used to, you don't see that bumper sticker much anymore, but it used to be popular. And I always thought what they really meant was think globally and just feel really bad about things. Instead of, they didn't really take the second part of that very seriously. Um, 
Now, everyone gets upset if I don't talk about climate change, which is not the elephant in the room, it's the Godzilla in the room, right? It's just this, you know, I mean, it's almost interplanetary if you want to play it out far enough, right? Um, uh, and I tried to avoid it for years because it is such a black hole. Uh, but I'm going to make four one-sentence propositions that will, could well raise hackles, but I suspect most people have not heard before. Uh, first, uh, you may see the consequent logic leading to this. First, the, environmental, uh, the, the climate change issue is eating the environmental movement alive, and I think has done much to bring it to its current low state of esteem among non-true believers. Uh, I can talk a long time about what's behind that proposition. Second, this is really important, the environmental movement not just the environmental movement, the first Bush administration shares some blame with us too. Uh, I'll just say the policymaking community, but driven by environmentalists mostly. They made a catastrophic mistake 25 years ago at the very beginning when they conceived of the issue of climate change as a conventional air pollution problem to be dealt with with regulatory structures like we did for conventional air pollution. As I say there's a lot, of, of, uh, a lot to go into that proposition. And as I say, the Bush administration committed to that policy architecture, and that was a mistake. And interestingly enough, the Obama administration, starting, following in some ways a few things that were haltingly talked about and set in motion by the second Bush administration, is moving away from that in very halting ways that it's really hard to sort of see unless you get deep into the weeds like I am. Uh, third, uh, this flows from the last proposition, someday I'm confident that come what may, we're going to look back on this whole forlorn period of the Kyoto Protocol and you know, the meeting culminating in Paris here in three months. We're going to look at this as the climate policy equivalent of wage and price controls to fight inflation in the 70s, which failed miserably as a tool to fight inflation and no sane person would advocate today. Uh, and I've been saying for a while that we can already mark out the Kyoto Protocol as the climate diplomacy equivalent of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Anyone remember that from high school history? The, 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 the treaty we signed saying we won't go to war anymore? Yeah, that worked well, didn't it? Um, uh, I, I go on a lot about all this. Uh, my fifth prop, I said I had four. There's a fifth proposition, which lately I've been playing with a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I don't say I'm bored with the science argument, but it's so sprawling and you never get anywhere with it. But one of the things I figured out was it almost doesn't matter. And, and here's why. Um, I'll put the proposition this way. The more severe climate change turns out to be, if you're inclined to think that way, fine. The more severe climate change turns out to be, the less plausible are the ideas of environmentalists for dealing with it. There's really only one thing that will work to solve this problem. You need to have massive new forms of low or no carbon energy that are as cheap or cheaper than our current forms. And that's a technological development problem. No one knows how to do this. And we should be honest in admitting that and getting after it in ways besides subsidizing what are really inferior subjects or you know, paying rent seekers. The whole ethanol business is a complete ridiculous uh, catastrophe and we can't get rid of it. Um, wind and solar are very limited. We need two things. You need a carbon neutral liquid fuel. Ethanol really doesn't work for that uh, if you do the total life cycle analysis. And or, uh, I think and you need both. And you need massively scalable uh, battery technology that can actually store electrons from wind and solar, but also from conventional power plants and nuclear power plants. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Elon Musk is investing a lot of money in this, but the, the scale needs of this are so massive. Uh, and people try and do this all this happy talk about, it. let's just build more windmills and more solar panels and this will work, and it won't, if you really go through the numbers. There's a few thoughts on that. It's not so much that I'm gloomy, but thinking that people are not, are just unserious about all that. I think I can go on forever about this. I've just laid out a few things, but I think I want to stop. I've gone about 30 minutes here a bit, I think. And um, I think I will stop here, though. And then, you know, Bill, Bill arrived. Great. So um, this is great. Bill Tucker, William Tucker, Bill Tucker, old friend. Um, I, I'm not quite sure the right way to, you wrote a book back in the 70s about the, uh, what was the title? Progress and Privilege. Progress and Privilege. What was the subtitle? It was? America in the Age of Environmentalism. Oh, well that's not, I mean, okay, but you, you were pretty tough on him like I've been. Uh, but also, I think what you're most no, noted for is being sort of, uh, you've always been my go-to guy on nuclear power. And I'll say this about it, I mean, we haven't seen it in a long time. Uh, this is an interesting thing. Um, a lot of environmentalists will privately tell you that the biggest mistake they made in the last 40 years was opposing nuclear power in the 70s. And there's one fellow I've gotten to know, I won't, he's not a household name, so it wouldn't matter anyway, but he now sits atop one of the major liberal 
foundations. He oversees about $300 million in grants on energy. And he was once a public utility regulator in a western state, very green, very for renewables. And he told me over dinner, this is actually with our pals in Oakland, the single biggest mistake of my life and our friends was opposing nuclear power 40 years ago. Uh, so Bill, you've really been vindicated, I think. And by the way, this particular fellow, I say, if I name the organization, I think you'd be sort of amazed. He didn't want to give any more money to the Sierra Club and the NRDC. He's tired of them. And I've had people at Environmental Defense Fund say, yeah, you know, nuclear, yeah, we botched that. We really ought to have nuclear, but we can't say it publicly because our members will kill us because the grassroots are not there. That's a problem for them, not for me, not for Bill. Anyway, I'll stop there. I've been cranky enough. Thank you all very much. I want to say that, you know, Steve, because he's thought about this so much, he really articulates things that, that you've thought of or that you've kind of put together. So I, I want to thank him for uh, inviting me, articulating it, and of course, putting new, a new spin on things as well. Um, you, you mentioned the uh, conservation and conservative mix up, the etymology of it. Uh, I was a student at uh, UCLA from 1985 to 87, and um, 1984 was the first presidential election I, <coughs> I voted in, and I voted for Ronald Reagan. And uh, I was very committed conservative in, in, uh, as a young, uh, in my 20s. Um, so I, I saw a job, uh, a job offer, and it said, and I thought it was the League of Conservative Voters. <laughs> and I went over, and I showed up in Santa Monica. It was about 5.50 an hour, something like that, but that was money for me. And, um, when I showed up, it was the League of Conservation Voters. And so I, I kind of just recoiled and walked back. So now I, I don't know if that was good or bad. I, I ended up making a living working in the environment area. But uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-environment, as I know Steve is not. But, but I, I thought of that also as kind of a, a timeline that in, by 1985, there was, a, there was an understanding that the two were, didn't mix well. That was my experience at the time. Um, one of the, th the other, the next thing I wanted to say was, um, I'm not Catholic, as maybe you can tell, but um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say something. When, when, I when I found out that we were going to be meeting at uh, St. Francis College, I, uh, I actually was reminded of uh, something that was uh, St. Francis that came up in a, uh, an environmental paper. And um, that's really where I, I want to, I want to use that as a starting point. And, and I guess, you know, Steve, you said you were philosophical. I may be even more philosophical, so I won't be long, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, we won't be too uh, esoteric. But um, in, in this paper, Lynn White, it's, uh, Lynn White, who was a medieval historian, he uh, it's called The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. 1967 Science Magazine, Mr. Place, it's early. 1967, right, so. But still widely read and recited, yeah. Yes, still widely read, and, and in it, the, the thing that I remembered about it and where he mentions St. Francis is St. Francis is the hero. And uh, I'm quoting here now, he says, the key to an understanding of Francis is his belief in the virtue of humility, not merely, not merely for the individual, but for man as a species. Francis tried to depose man from his monarchy over creation and set up a democracy of all God's creatures. So. Um, again, I'm not really that familiar with all of the theology of it, but he, he poses um, Francis's approach as one of humility as opposed to being rapacious and taking um, to, to seize the earth and to, uh, to work the earth. Um, he was certainly trying to discourage or to uh, be critical of the, uh, the tendency of, of modern technology to take over the earth and uh, the notion of, of granting equality to all of God's creatures was something that uh, would prevent you from that. But I, I think that there's another side of it that, um, that, that perhaps those that, that wanted to protect the environment um, moved away from this initial point. And I, and I think it actually relates to conservatism, and that's the humility aspect of it. So the notion that humility is something that keeps us away from uh, hurting the environment, but also humility is something that allows us to uh, recognize that the environment is bigger than us. It's not something that we can control. It's not something that we can ensure for 50 years from now or 100 years from now. What we can do is we can work with the environment. We can steward the environment. We can react to, uh, to short-term, mid-term 
types of uh, chal environmental challenges, but not think about it going long term. So I, I think that there's a, a religious resonance, with, or religious conservative argument for saying uh, environmentalism should be about respecting nature, but not thinking that it requires our stewardship, our management, in order to be, um, in order to uh, to flourish. Um, my own, one of my own conservative heroes over the years uh, was George Will, and I, I just pulled this out of the uh, the Washington Post from a little while ago. Let's see, I have the date here. It's from April of this year. Um, he says that the term sustainable postulates fragility and scarcity that entail government planners and rationers to fend off planetary calamity while administering equity. So he's always good at writing. I mean, he certainly gets a lot in there. Um, but the, the point is that, once again, nature herself is something fragile and that needs our help. And that's where government rushes in to provide that help. So I think that similar to the, the religious point of view of, of looking, at, um, looking at, at, at Earth, looking at nature as something that we can uh, steward, but not something that we're responsible for or capable of managing into the, the distant future. Similarly, I think politically, that's the manifestation of, well, we can manage the, the Earth, and that, that becomes the, um, what is it, the... Uh, allows, it, it entails government planners, or, or it gives agency to government to plan, um, to plan the environment. So I, I think that uh, where environmentalism moved is from, uh, from the, where, where the switch took place in environmentalism was when it, it became, and this is something I know I, I've read in Steve's work, but the, the supreme ability to diagnose social problems, having the agency to address those problems, and the deep human need for control over the environment, those are all manifest in the, um, in, in the, the, the left-wing uh, embracing of environmentalism. I, I think that uh, it also really is part of the climate change argument, because the climate change argument is about having some, da some data in front of us, but really what we're responding to are models that go very far out into the future. So, um, once again, there's, a, uh, there's the notion that the environment will fall into catastrophe. It's something that we, we, we are able to, with our, own, uh, with our own skills, we are able to predict with some kind of certitude what's going to happen, and therefore we can act to address that. That itself uh, speaks against humility and uh, speaks to a fragile world that, that, that requires us to, uh, to uh, protect it. Uh, scientifically, I just saw, speaking about it religiously and politically, I, I think on the third, the third point, and this is um, an idea really I got from an ecologist, Daniel Botkin, yeah. who's over at uh, Santa Barbara. He says, uh, nature itself is not, uh, economists think of things as they establish an equilibrium and then basically they figure out how things are going to reach the equilibrium. I know Fred is, a, is an eminent economist, and so therefore, it becomes self-consistent, and once the argument's self-consistent, it's true. So I think that um, natural scientists or climate modelers have done the same thing in terms of trying to set up some equilibrium or some kind of uh, state that they, they envision in the future, and then the models become consistent with that. But it's not, um, nature may not be, nature, nature as a scientist, I would say, nature doesn't, um, respond to models. Nature is. We try to model what nature is, but nature is. So it's not about our models, it's about what, what nature is. I, I thought of two examples uh, to speak about the kind of environmentalism that would be suggested by this different attitude, a more humble attitude, uh, one that sees the earth as being less fragile, and one that doesn't see it, the earth needing to conform to our models. Um, in 2014, the biggest problem that they had in the state of Connecticut with all the storms was the tree limbs, because the state planners didn't plan on the fact that they were going to have so much forest in, um, in Connecticut. And actually, the entire east coast of the United States can be classified as forest because of the regrowth of trees. I don't know if you get that in Brooklyn. I live out in Jersey. We get trees, you know, if, if I don't cut them down every year, then there's just more and more trees. Uh, growing 
um, naturally. So I, I think some of the preoccupation with catastrophe in the future prevents us from seeing some of the problems that are right in front of our face, like tree limbs that are going to fall on electric lines, which is uh, certainly a problem. And I think the other example, which Steve mentioned, is biofuels, which is a disaster for the environment. But once again, based on the model, e everything worked out. And based on our, um, well, there, there's also a lot of good intentions involved, which supposedly will uh, make, it, make it all better. But I think biofuels is another example of kind of thinking about conforming to these 20, 30 year plans without necessarily recognizing the damage you're doing right now to the environment. Um, I wanted, just on the last points that you said, I think that from conservative environmentalism, to move from the term climate change to low carbon or a no carbon uh, energy economy, I think would be a wise move because what, what all people, just like Steve asked, who, who's against the environment? Who wants to destroy the environment? No one. Um, I, I think you'd find less opposition by talking about low or no carbon, and you don't concede the point about climate change. Climate change is a very sophisticated scientific question, and uh, I, I think I, the people that really are certain about the answer are promoting something or they're selling something. If you're a scientist, you know that we can't speak with real certitude about what's going to happen in 20 years. We don't understand feedbacks. Things like clouds aren't all even uh, well um, incorporated into the model. And um, finally, I think that just my own comment, this is my physics comment, I think batteries are a no-go no matter what we do. We can maybe double them, but, but still a Tesla today, half the weight the Tesla's carrying is the batteries. So that's a problem, and that's after a lot of, this is after many billions of dollars that they put into batteries. There's some fundamental electrochemical reasons why batteries aren't going to get that much lighter. And when you say carbon neutral liquids, fuels, you said liquids, so I guess that, that, that's something about hydrogen. Because hydrogen is carbon neutral, is, is hydrogen is a carbon... I should have said portable fuel. Okay, no, 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 that's fine. You didn't mean to, to exclude hydrogen. Yeah. There's people that argue against hydrogen or against gaseous fuels also, but anyways, I just wanted to say that, uh, to include, to think of hydrogen as also a non-carbon fuel. And, um, I, but I, I wrote here something. It just, so, so the type of conservative environmentalism that I envision, it would, will require a humility commensurate with our understanding, our understanding of science, and some knowledge of the mechanisms at play to identify opportunities for self-regulation. So it's more, I, I guess that sounds like Cass Sunstein, we're, we're trying to nudge the environment, but, but we're, we're not taking full, um, we're not taking full uh, control over the environment. So, those are my, also I just wanted to mention, it was very nice to meet Fred, and I guess Fred is really our host, so. I, I thank Steve and St. Francis, so I wanted to thank you as well. Thank you. I think I'd like to start by going back to my original point in that uh, book that I wrote in 1980 and uh, made in an article, a, a cover story we had in Harper's in 1977 called Environmentalism and the Leisure Class. Uh, I think uh, what is so puzzling about environmentalism and it's hard to identify is that it, it, it's really an aristocratic philosophy. And we don't have an aristocracy in this country. At least we don't, seemingly don't have an aristocracy. We don't have it the way Europe does, for example. And in, in Europe, it's very easy to identify the environmentalists. It's Prince Charles <laughs> and uh, on down. And uh, uh, the organizations that, that, that uh, practice environmentalism are, uh, it's, it's hard to, they're tremendously wealthy. I think this is something that, that escapes notice, too. Uh, Greenpeace, for example, is mostly uh, based in Europe. They have a larger budget. They have $150 million a year budget. They have a larger budget than the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. They are fantastically wealthy, and they are able to move around the world and, and uh, you know, just oppose. I, they're also one of the greatest uh, public relations agencies in the world. Uh, they always do these spectacular events like parachuting off the Eiffel Tower or something like that. And uh, 
But it's, it's pretty much, the Sierra Club is very much like that in this country too. They're tremendously wealthy. And uh, what aristocracies have always been known for is opposition to further development of industrial society. Uh, you saw that this was very common in Europe. The, uh, the old uh, aristocracies were always fighting the, the merchant class. And uh, the interesting thing I, uh, I think uh, is you saw it in this uh, country in, in the South uh, up until about the 1930s. The South, remember, thought of itself as, as the, the uh, you know, the heirs of the, of the of uh, European aristocracy, when they were ha they had a plantation society that was uh, based on very largely on leisure and on having a lot of land and wealth. And uh, in about 1930, there was a group of the fugitive poets at Vanderbilt uh, University, a lot of famous names: uh, Alan Tate and, and uh, Clint Brooks and, and Robert Penn Warren. But they wrote a book called "I'll Take My Stand." And uh, it's very interesting. You, you read it in the, th in the, it was written in the 1930s. It is, it is environmentalism. It is what we uh, experience today as, uh, and it was arguing against the industrialization of the South. It was saying, let's keep our, our uh, landed uh, society here. It was one, uh, and they argued against uh, manufacturers. They said, you know, stick with the old ways, the old, as one, one poet said, great, had a great line, I always quote, he said, throw away that radio and take that old fiddle down from the wall. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, let's go back to our square dances and our play parties and our old fashioned ways. Uh, so there's always been this strain of, we've gone far enough. We've, uh, you know, we've had enough progress. We've got enough progress. It's time to call a halt to this. This is what the 70s environmentalism was about, was uh, let's, you know, industrial society is going too far. This was Al Gore's uh, uh, argument, you know. We've, we've overstepped, we've gone, we've, it's gotten out of control, we don't control it anymore. Uh, let's go back to the old fashioned ways like windmills and, and uh, solar collectors and things that uh, come from the Middle Ages perhaps. Uh, now, it's changed a little bit now in that uh, you have a, a kind of a, an upper middle class aristocracy that, that is very technology oriented. And uh, they've, uh, and environmentalism has become sort of a California thing now. <laughs> uh, you know, we're going to solve everything with computers and with uh, smart grids and with technology is going to carry us through. Uh, only specific times of technology, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, so I, what, uh, I think the appeal of environmentalism now is that uh, in my book I talked about how just about everybody becomes an environmentalist when they move to the suburbs and they buy their single family home, they had this beautiful field next door. And uh, they settled in, and in about six months, suddenly, somebody desperately knocks on the door and says, my God, you know, we're living in Maple Grove's Acres here. You know our beautiful field next door? It's Maple Grove's Acres too. It's the next step of, this, of the uh, development, and they're going down to the planning board tonight, and to prove it, we gotta get down there and stop them. So everybody becomes an environmentalist. When you reach a point where you're you know, sort of comfortable with what you have, then, the, then development becomes a threat. Uh, the, the Forest Service used to have a saying, they said, the guy who built his mountain cabin last year is an environmentalist. The guy who wants to build his this year is a developer. So. so uh, so there, there's, there's a logic to it that, that can appeal, you know, well down the, the economic uh, spectrum. But uh, I think that the, the thing you really have to watch out for, I mean, the other, well, another way of looking at this is to say that uh, aristocracies are often right in what they're trying to do. 
you know, they're good at sponsoring operas, they're good at sponsoring art museums, they're good at sponsoring archaeology. Uh, you, you can't just dismiss uh, uh, the, these kind of concerns as, well, you know, kind of a Marxist <laughs> attitude. It's just aristocracy. Uh, and a lot, obviously, a lot of the concerns that were been brought about environmentalism have turned out to be quite correct and quite true and uh, quite uh, manageable. But the thing you have to be careful, this particularly true of the Sierra Club, I think, is that there's, with them, there's always this argument that we don't, we don't want to do anything. We're happy with the way things are. And uh, they, the Sierra Club has, sort of has the, uh, the, the, uh, the attitude of uh, support globally, oppose locally. You know. <laughs> therefore, therefore, renewable energy, therefore, therefore hydroelectricity. Uh, you know, that's, <laughs> well, that's a, yeah, I know, that's the thing. That's, cl that's clean, you know, that's clean energy. But of course, they run, at the same time, they're going around the country trying to tear down dams, and not just small dams. You know, they had a referendum in San Francisco to, to, uh, to tear down the Hetch Hetchy Dam, which provides Cal uh, San Francisco with two-thirds of its water and half its electricity, I think. This was a serious matter on the ballot. I don't know what the heck they were going to do if they passed it. But, uh, uh, but there is, uh, I mean, Sierra Club. It was defeated pretty soon. By what proportions? I think it was 75, 25. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't too serious, yeah. It wasn't too serious now. Uh, the Sierra Club is, a, is in favor of uh, solar energy, but not particular solar projects. You know, they, they threaten the desert. Uh, there's a, the wet, they're in favor of wind energy, but there's a, there was a uh, transmission line in Los Angeles, the north path, I think, green, green something path that uh, somebody was going to want to bring this wind energy into Los Angeles, they opposed the, uh, the transmission lines. And they defeated it. Uh, so they're very good at, uh, at defeating, the, I mean, the, I've, I've seen stories, somebody proposing a two, two megawatt dam in northern Idaho or something on a, on a little stream. And the Sierra Club was in court the, the day after it was uh, it was proposed. It's local Sierra Club organizations, you know, and they say, well, we don't, we, you know, we can't control what they want to do if they want local. But uh, the national organization uh, supports these things in lip service, but uh, the Sierra Club itself is always opposed to them. Um, now, I think global warming is, is a, uh, it's funny, it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. I don't, uh, I don't think it's a fraud. I don't think it's a hoax. Uh, there's a real s logic to it, and there seems to be some something going on. Uh, but once again, I, I mean, I, I hadn't heard that story that uh, environmentalists are quietly saying they they wish they hadn't opposed nuclear power. But by God, I mean, when you look at the history, uh, uh, Glenn Seaborg said in the 1950s that nuclear power had come along just at the right time because we were approaching the limits of, uh, of fossil fuels. That we were, hit, we were, I mean, air, air, air pollution was a tremendous concern at the time. And uh, we, it was a question of the resources, whether we were going to have enough resources for oil and gas and so forth. Uh, now, the, uh, coal, coal was being phased out in the early 70s. It was, uh, there were a lot of coal plants, they, they switched coal, you had to use low sulfur coal, and uh, a lot of coal plants were opposed, a lot of, because many of them were closed, and they were replaced by nuclear uh, reactors. And it was, that, that was at the point, the, the road not taken, you know, Amory Levins wrote his famous piece in Foreign Affairs about the road not taken, you know, pulling up this old Robert Frost saw about two roads diverging, and he wanted to take the, the soft path, the, the, uh, the renewable energy path. Uh, but the fact is that the road not taken at that point was nuclear power, 
and uh, we might we would have uh, we would be me we we would be would be dealing with these global with these uh, global warming concerns right now if we had kept up with nuclear. Now there are uh, problems with existing nuclear, but uh, you're, you're talking about we got to find something cheap. The books I'm reading right now are all titled uh, "Energy Cheaper Than Coal." <laughs> And serious, and uh, well, it's serious because uh, there's a different type of reactor that uh, Alvin Weinberg invented in the 60s of uh, where the fuel, instead of the fuel being in solid fuel rods that can melt down, it's actually in a bath of liquid salts. And uh, it operates at, nor at normal pressures. Uh, it can't melt down. If the thing, if the thing overheats, it automatically uh, it regulates itself because the, the, the liquid expands and the reaction slows down. And if things really get bad, they have something they call the freeze plug at the bottom of the, of the reactor there. And that, if the reactor starts to heat up too much, that plug melts and the whole thing just drains into a great big bathtub and reaction stops, that's it. They call it walk away safe. Uh, and there are a couple, there's been a big revival of this. Uh, a lot of people talk about thorium too, as a because it doesn't involve plutonium and it doesn't have that uh, uh, proliferation risk. But uh, there's a move afoot. It's very quiet, I must admit. Uh, but there's a move afoot now to revive some of these different nuclear technologies. There's a, about a half dozen little companies that have that are. Uh, you know, they're all MIT scientists and, and people who have uh, looked into this. And they're trying to revive, trying to come up with a plan. Of course, they have to go through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is the, often called the Nuclear Rejection Commission. Uh, so there's a lot of talk of uh, going to foreign countries and, and, and developing this. And of course, the foreign, I mean, nuclear is, is, uh, is really going great guns in the rest of the world, the Chinese are throwing up, I think they have about 20 reactors under, under construction, and the Russians have gotten very good at it. The Koreans uh, won, the pro won a uh, contract in the United Arab uh, Emirates for, to, uh, to build five reactors there. They've gotten so good at it. So we're, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're letting it all slip away right now. but. There really is a solution to global warming. I mean, uh, the difference between nuclear and coal is just uh, extraordinary. <coughs> and of course, the main uh, proposal for wind and solar is that we would put up, there's a guy at Stanford who's published, he's become sort of the, the, uh, the guru of renewable energy. His proposal is that we build 3.5 million 60-story windmills uh, in order to uh, power the world uh, and uh, 89, 90,000 solar farms and stuff like that. Uh, uh, let me put it this way. It's something, it's an old conversation you and I had, Bill, seven, eight years ago just came back to me while, while we're talking. Um, uh, so, uh, look, there's this active scientific argument about are, are we able to predict things on a regional scale very accurately yet? Some of that, yes, some no, and a long story. Um, and then the other big question is, what is climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon dioxide? We look at 550 parts per million. Sorry to do numbers. I try not to do that. Um, and okay, so you know, a lot of smart people say that's really bad. Other people say no, and there's journal articles and all the rest of that. Bill and I here a few years ago said, well, wait a minute. Let, let that play out. We don't want to get to 1,000 parts per million. That's several hundred years off, but you don't want to get to that, right? Remember that? Remember, I remember I had forgotten about this until just tonight when yeah. I saw you. Uh, now, so there's time to avoid that. Um, and so, by the way, if you get after the long-term problem, um, and then, by the way, there's a second part of it. So, suppose that, you know, there, there's still an active argument about how much of what's going on is happening for natural reasons, you know, changes in ocean currents, changes in wind patterns. Some of it may be greenhouse gas related, some not. There's all, feed, all the rest of that, and that, you know, those you know, endless tangles. Uh, what if some of the warming that we have had or that we might still get uh, is for some tangle we can't work out? Well, then just suppressing greenhouse gas emissions might not get the whole problem. And that's when you have to start entertaining 
you know, other kinds of adaptation measures. Geoengineering is hugely controversial, and I'm not an enthusiast of that, by the way, although I think it should be researched. Um, uh, um, so, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the problem is it's such a sprawling problem, it's, it's a hard question to answer. But there's a few thoughts. We don't want to go to a thousand parts per million or more. I think that one of the main points is that the, the consequences of this and the, the immediacy of it are just wildly exaggerated. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous, you know. Sports Illustrated runs a picture of the <laughs> Miami Marlins playing in knee-deep water. Uh, I, I, I think, it, you know, all this business of the coasts being, you know, inundated and everything, it, it's just, it, it's a ridiculous concern. Uh, and the idea that it's the number one concern for the country now, that Obama is trying to make <laughs> in an era where you got refugee crises and, and and uh, terrorism crisis, and to say, well, our real concern is global warming. It, it, it's just bizarre. Well, I would say it's effective just for that reason, because it takes, it takes <laughs> people's <laughs> minds off of uh, other things that are more consequential. Yeah. And it's, uh, but, as, but as a long-run concern, I mean, uh, you know, can we uh, cut back on coal and, and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. It has legitimate effect. Yeah, I have the, it's a hydrogen coal fusion hydrogen and, and, uh, oh. and nickel that's um, heated up and produces energy and supposedly quite a lot. Is that cold fusion? Yeah, cold fusion. Yeah, that, that's a very debatable thing that people <laughs> claim to have. Here, here's my, I teach a whole energy policy course and so here's the three things I tell students they need to learn, never mind all the fine points. There's three questions on energy. And you know, the three words, density, cost, and scale. Density means, you, you know, the reason why gasoline, this much gasoline is so good is it puts a lot of energy in a little space. And the reason that wind and solar are not so good is you take tons of room and a lot of material to get not that much energy. And that, that's the scale, that's the second one, scale. It's gotta be scalable. And even a lot of fusion things are, I mean, I've, I've toured a couple of the plasma fusion labs that uh, the government funds. and. You know, what I would say about fusion is, is fusion has always been 10 years away for the last 40 years. And maybe we'll get there, but boy, I have, I've toured the German labs, uh, fusion lab at the Max Planck Institute. And boy, the, you know, the technical challenge there are immense. And they're talking, no, actually not 10 years, 40 years, we might have a, our first commercial scale fusion reactor if we can fix these problems. So a lot of things you hear about, you can do all kinds of things. And then cost, it can't be super expensive. You can do, yeah, one of the frustrations about media coverage is you'll read, somebody's done this nifty thing in a laboratory. We can make a gasoline out of carbon dioxide. That was Los Alamos had that. And I always sort of say, okay, how much can you make? And what does it cost? And you find, and reporters never ask these questions. And you usually never hear these stories again. Why? Because it costs $20 a gallon to make one of these things in the lab. You do all kinds of fancy things in the lab because we're smart and, and students like to do this stuff and it's good, but nobody gets the next step is how do you make it as cheap as our current energy sources? And until you can do that, it's not going to, it's just not going to play out because you can't subsidize it enough. I think it's just got, it's gotten to be a matter of uh, everything that happens in the weather is, is a result of global warming. Right. People think, people think Hurricane Katrina was, was a a global warming phenomenon. It was, just, it was a hurricane. It, it's, I mean, I can see a case for an eight-foot rise if, uh, if you can demonstrate a pattern of reasonable risk of storm surges being that high. Uh, but an awful lot of what goes on, though, is not that. I mean, out in California, you know, I've been a lifelong resident. Half the state's burning down right now. We've had storms, not hurricanes, but coastal houses are wiped out. And so we have very strict, and earthquakes, very strict design standards and retrofit standards. I've been through that with a couple of houses cost you money. Um, and some of those are plausible. You know, if we have a big earthquake, we're going to be glad we did a lot of that. And we, we're probably going to wish we'd done more of it. But boy, an awful lot of what happens, I've seen this with big fires that race through Santa Barbara and other places, is the, the utopians come along and they say, well, we don't just want to have better fire standards and setbacks and other things. There's the social engineering that goes with it. And if you're actually, and in the worst cases, we're actually saying to somebody, you can't rebuild at all, even though there's no sort of realistic prospect that's going to be underwater in 50 years, that ought to be a straight out takings claim. And if you had a robust takings law, that problem is solved in a hurry and would stop. I do think, and I'm urging Republican politicians, including a couple running for president, you ought to have the attitude, we want to compete on this issue. And also, you know, Republicans are too defensive. I mean, they're like deer in the headlights. And I say, no, no, the attitude you want to have is, we can do this better than you, for the reason I was stating about, uh, just push the button, we'll see the time. For the reason I stated at the beginning, the environmentalists have made a royal mess of things. Um, 
Uh, yeah, sustainability. Uh, Rachel's done, done this great report with the National Association of Scholars on Sustainability with Peter Wood, and that's just become this wide open term that anything attaches to, and it's trivialized it. There's sensible applications of the idea of sustainability, and that's not what we're getting, and that can't go on forever. I'll stay hey, I, first, let, me, let me thank everyone. Oh.